Excited to have uh, our next guest on the uh, program. Of course, he is uh, currently one of the uh, best, if not the best, uh, color analysts in the National Hockey League. He was a he's a rare breed. He's a draft pick of the Hartford Whalers back in uh, 1982. Of course, played uh, o- almost uh, 1,300 uh, NHL games. Uh, scored over 400 goals. Uh, has 900 points. Ray Ferraro joins us. Razor, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm a little tired. Um, I'm in the East, stayed up and watched the overtime, uh, you know, game five. And um, man, these series are played a lot different East to West. I'll tell you that. That uh, oh. that that track meet in in Alberta was something to watch. And out here, it's um, it, it, there's just there's no room. It's just like grind and check. And um, but I'm good. I'm good. It's fun to do these games. Oh, hey, having uh, having played that uh, that type of hockey for the uh, the Wheat Kings and the Winter Hawks, right? I'm guessing uh, you are watching that uh, maybe with a little bit of envy, but also with a guy who who understands uh, you know how how it is to get hot early in a playoff series, like Evander Kane. You know, one of the few guys who's had uh, uh, ten goals uh, that early in a playoff series. Just we, we want to get to the East, but quickly, give me your thoughts on on the overall play of the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, your expectations of them, uh, regardless whether they play Colorado or St. Louis? Well, it's hard to summarize the Oilers in that series in one statement. It was like there was eight different things that were happening, kind of all at the same time. Like the, you know, the first game was so wild. I, you know, I, I mean, it would be hard to find a playoff game with worse goaltending at either end of the ice than game one. And it was at both ends at the same time. Like it was a calamity. And then, you know, so now you got to fight your way back in the series. I think what impresses me most about the Oilers is there's, um, there's an ability to buy into a harder way to play. And as, as per example, Florida didn't quite get that. They didn't get the message yet. And three years ago, Tampa didn't get the message and Columbus kicked them to the curb. And it's hard to play in the playoffs and you have to play some games the way you don't want to play. And so I, I, I think that's what has impressed me about Edmonton. It's not always pretty, right? Like Mike Smith can be great or he can be flopping around all over the place and he's out of the position and the, and the net fills up, but then he just like grinds his way back into it. And I, and of course, they've got the you know they, they've got a, a half a dozen players just playing just incredible hockey to watch, I, incredible you know from Hyman to Kane to Drysaitel to of course McDavid. It's just it's really really an impressive run. Now, what who are they going to play? Who is it going to be next? I mean, I think everybody probably wants to think of McKinnon and McDavid playing you know head to head and what that might look like. But what if it's not? The best part is they get a few days off. They can rest. Leon Dreisaitl set a few NHL records in that series. Mm-hmm. And to me, the most impressive uh, five games, he scored three points in every game. Uh, the NHL regular season record is six straight. And that's when you're playing different teams, right? You know how it is. Like everybody, all they do is nowadays it's video and focus on one team and the Flames had no answer. And Dry Settle's not even 100%. Like, I know there's a lot of hype on McDavid, and rightfully so. But what Leon Dry Settle did in that series, 17 points in five games, that's, you know, that ties the NHL record for most points in five games. Uh, Rick Middleton had 17, and then he finished with 19 in, the, uh, in that seven game series in 83. But Dry Settle, to me, it's just, it, it's funny how he almost got overlooked because of McDavid's greatness. Well, I think that's the case almost every year, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, like whatever Drysidle does, it's oh yeah, but McDavid's you know more more. He's probably McDavid's probably got more points over the long run. Two, he does it in such spectacular fashion that who's gonna you know? I mean, what's the highlight? What it's not a it's not a Leon black backhand pass through traffic to somebody that taps it in. It's McDavid's hundred foot rush that he's got defensemen spinning around in a circle. Um, the fact that he was able to do it and figure out how to do it not healthy is is really something because it's hard to play when your head is on your health. Like like every time I'm I'm sure he tweaked that ankle a couple of times and went, oh my gosh, this really is killing me. 
but you've got to get past it somehow. I mean, there's a, there's a toughness to that, like an internal toughness. Of course, his ability is, I, I mean, his, the way he can shield people and then out of the shield, make the pass yeah. that he can make the, who scored the power play goal last night? The one timer I'm trying to think, uh, McDavid made this Bouchard. Unbe- no, it was a one timer off bo- uh, dry sidle pass. Oh, it was Hyman. It was the one timer that oh. Hyman in the shin pads. Um, but McDavid spins away from a good player in Backland on the boards. And you're like, man, like people can't do that. They can't do that. And then he gets it to dry sidle and it's in and out of the pocket so fast. Calgary's power play can't respond like what dry sidle did in that moment gets overshadowed by what mcdavid did on the boards and i think it's probably a a way in general to to think about what dry sidle does when i watch him play i'm mesmerized by that bore that he uses like i just i cannot <laughs> stop looking at the thing yeah. and how he makes the play out of both sides front and back the way that he shoots the puck he's so strong they're they're a matchup disaster for any team whether they play them together or apart like how how do you how do you slow them down calgary's only chance really i thought was out of the series most of the time and that's chris tanev like was to he's big and long and he covers lots of room but he wasn't healthy and didn't play much and the other guys just it it turned out to be no match ray you mentioned the matchup headache and it was interesting to see Jay Woodcroft's touch as things weren't quite right in the first period. He moves Kane down to the second line. Hyman comes up. And, you know, I, I think my question for you is, Ray, to, you know, to, did you see this coming? Like, I don't think anyone saw the Oilers winning in a short series. You know, maybe you could make the case ahead of time that they'd win in a long series with, with the stars that they have. But you, you've watched enough Oilers games this season – you know, and, and especially against the Kings in the first round, I was like, where did this maturity come from? You mentioned mm. buy into a hard way to play. There's also this mental toughness that they showed with all the different things that they went through in the series down four goals. Like it was like, yeah, so what we're going to come back in game one. They came back from four goals twice who like, I, I didn't see the maturity level for this team coming. How does a team develop that over a playoff run? I uh, well, you get some success, you get some, and so that success gives you a little belief. You you do it once, so you think you can do it again. Um, I know, I know Duncan Keith has just taken it in the teeth there all season long. He seems to be like, you know, the price was too high, the salary's too high. It's not about making a speech. It's about when things go off the rails so far that you just keep doing your job. And I think that's one thing that Keith has always done. Look, he's not the most vocal guy. He's not the most, he's not going to give up any great speeches, but whether he gets beat or not, he's just plowing ahead. He's been there before, but the guy to me that helps build that whole mindset you're talking about more than, more than anybody is Zach Hyman. I am an enormous Zach Hyman fan. I think he's an 11 out of 10 as a person. Um, There is no battle that's too small that he's not going to fight on the ice. He thinks he can win every puck battle, even when he doesn't have a chance. And so if you're playing with him, it becomes infectious. I think Toronto really missed Hyman. I mean, I know why they couldn't keep him because there's $6 million of reasons why they couldn't keep him. So that belief builds through players like that. And then your best players, they have seen that the other way to play isn't the right way. It, it's, it's, not, it's funny. It's not the wrong way, but it's not the winning way. And, and so maybe the best example of this um, that I can think of in my NHL career is two of them, really, uh, is Brian Trache back in the 80s and Patrice Bergeron. Like there is... There are more flashy players. There are more skilled players. But there's a right way that drags your team in, and you become the example whether you think you are or not. Hyman is that for the Oilers. It's interesting because I don't know that anyone necessarily thought of him, Ray, kind of coming in as that heartbeat engine, you know, sort of player that could help move this team forward. And then 
to see the production ramp up. And then at this time of the year, well, I mean, obviously the Leafs didn't really get that opportunity in round two, but to see Hyman, um, you know, step up in key moments has really been something to watch. Well, I, I did. Um, so over the last, however many years I've done 25 to 27 Leaf games a year. So I watched Zach Hyman from three feet away and I watch him come back to the bench and no matter what's going on, he's got the same look on his face. Like he's just focused. He's dialed in. He's not emotional. He's not up and down. Um, he just plows straight ahead. He came into the league. He was going to be a checker. He was on their, on their third line, their matchup line. And then eventually they said, you know what? We got we to gotta get somebody that can get the puck to Matthews. Like we've got to find a way to get the puck off the wall to the game's be- you know, one of the game's best shooters. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, he was wasted on the third line because he can make a play. He can skate. He can take a hit to make a play, and he retrieves the puck. I I think it better than anybody else in the league. I I can't think of a guy right now that does it more and does it better than Hyman. And so he becomes – his effort becomes an example. Like, to him, it's no different. Like, it's just the game. That's how he plays. If – I can guarantee you in summer hockey, Zach Hyman is terrible. He's one of the worst players in the game because that's not his game. There's a, like, what's he going to do? Dangle, toe drag around guys? It's not going to happen. But you put the puck on the ice for real. I want him on my team. Ray, let's get to the uh, Carolina uh, Rangers series, of course. Uh, it's It's been a homer series. It's amazing that Carolina has uh, yet to lose at home and yet to win on the road. And, and obviously the Rangers are hoping that continues. Um you mentioned there's no space out there. You like there's there seemingly is, is a lot of skill. Now there's no McDavid yep. skill or dry settle on either team, but what 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 has to happen t- for that to change? Is it just a system thing? And ultimately, is that Carolina's best chance to win is by playing that way? Well, I don't think Carolina can change the way they play, Jason. Um, they are extremely fast. Like when you watch them play, they are it's like the pace of what they play at is just remarkable. Like it really, really is. They're built for two things. They're built to check and they're built to play from in front. If they get behind in a game, they got, they got problems. They get down to nothing, man. That's going to be a lot. That, that's going to be tough for them. They've got five 20 goal scores and two 30 goal score, scores. It's, it's depth all up and down their lineup. They have a tremendous defense. Um, Jacob Slavin, I know people talk about him, but oh my gosh, man, like I'm sure he's made a mistake in the series. I just can't recall it. Uh, Brett Pesci is really a very good player. Brady Shea has had a terrific playoff. These are all big space eaters that can skate. So it's tough to score against them. They don't give up any goals. They gave up 200 in the regular season, but this home to road thing, I think has now taken on a life of its own. Like it's impossible to be that great at home and suck that badly on the road. Like it's the same team. You just change the jerseys, the matchups that they get at home are really advantageous. So if, for example, if they were playing the Oilers um, and, and, and Jay Woodcroft decided to play the McDavid dry sidle group together, every shift in Carolina, they would get Shea and Slavin or uh, Shea and Pesci on the blue line, Fast, Stall, and Nita Ryder. Every shift. And they're all big and they're all in the way and they all can skate. And so then they they take out, in a lot of cases, the top line of a team. And then it's just a grind a thon with everybody else. Their power play last night scored. They were nine for 89 in the yeah. previous 26 games, like, good gracious. Like, like it's, it's hard to believe. So I don't think they can change. I, I am stunned that they have not won on the road and it's not sustainable because eventually you're going to lose at home. Like, you know, like if, if you play blackjack, you're not getting blackjack every hand, right? You're, yeah. you're going to lose eventually. And then they got these, you know, do you th- do you think Tampa cares where they play? No chance, right? They just steamroll straight ahead. And so Tampa's rested. 
they're getting healthy. They're not going to have point. It doesn't sound like, but um, I, I think Carolina's a Carolina's a problem for 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 teams to play because of the speed they play at. So the Rangers, if if they're going to come back here and win the series, obviously they got to win uh, game six at home and then go on the road into Carolina and win game seven. What do you feel they need to do, Ray? And what what stood out to you from a Ranger perspective? Uh, well, a couple things. What they need to do is they need to find the real Artemi Panarin and and they need to uncloak him because his style of play, you know, like you can make the mental picture of him getting the puck out in the neutral zone. He gets over the blue line and he pulls up and he looks for those cross seam passes. It's impossible against Carolina because they literally they thunder back their back pressure. He's got no time. So it's like the pace of the game has taken him out of the game. They've got to find a way to get him on track. Chris Kreider had, has had two shots total in games one, two, and five. He yeah. had eight in games three and four. Like He scored 52 goals. He had 253 shots. Like That can't be. Like If they're going to get back in you know, to even the series, those two guys in particular have to be really good. The, of their big guys, Mika Zibanejad has had a – a really impressive run here. I, I, the points might all not always be there, but he's around it all the time. He's used, he's big and he's, I, I've been really impressed. Uh, and of course, uh, the best goalie in the league this year is Igor Shesterkin. I mean, I know what Vasilevsky's done right now, but start to finish, it's been Shesterkin, and he's going to have to, he's going to have to be great. I just, I don't see any way that they win if he's just a so-so player. And so that's what I think to get back in. What's impressed me. Do you know how young these guys are? They have four defensemen under age 24, four of them. Like Braden Schneider, they called him up in January because they had a bunch of injuries and they haven't been able to send him back down. He's 20. Keandre Miller's 22. Fox and Lindgren are 24. Up front, uh, Heedle's 22. Kako's 20. Uh, Lafreniere, who's really come on, he's 20. Like, they're so young. I think they're ahead of schedule. Like, I I think their season is an unqualified success at this point. If they can win two more games, holy. And like, this is this is found money for the Rangers, in, in my opinion. Totally agree with you, Ray. I think the Rangers are going to be good for a long time now moving forward. I mean, starting with Shesterkin on out, and you consider how young he is, too. Um, Last one for me. We know you need to run. Um, which which streak ends, if any? Does Carolina find a way to win, win on the road, or do the Canes lose at home? This is how sure I am of this, Frank. Um, <laughs> after game four, I was certain the Rangers were going to win game five. They got 15 shots. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, you really know the game, don't you? There you are. That's a <laughs> solid thing. I, I think Carolina is going to go in and win because I think they're too good to keep losing on the road. Like if I'm Rod Brindamore, I go in there and go, guys, is this silly to anybody else? Like we're better than this. We won 25 times on the road this year. Like we can do this. And, and he's incredulous. Like when the, he's a really cool guy to talk to because he's so matter of fact, you'll say like, you know, like how, how, you know, you didn't, you guys didn't win last night. Yeah, we were, we were no good. We like, couldn't make a pass. Like he just, he's so honest. And he, he's like, I don't get it. He's like, we play great for 40 minutes, take two penalties. We give up a power play goal. We're the best power play or penalty killing team in the league. And then we lose. And you're like, well, how did that happen? So I, I think they're going to win game six, but I could be as wrong as I was 24 hours ago when I thought the Rangers were going to win the game five. Well, you've had the best seat in the house for that series, and you've had a really close eye on the Rangers all playoffs long, doing a lot of that series as well. Ray, thanks so much for your time. Great to have you. Great to talk a little playoffs, and uh, hope to run into you in a rink uh, sometime soon during these playoffs. Yeah, it will happen for sure. I hope you guys are great, and uh, thanks for having me on. Check in sometime, anytime.